I wrote this book because I wanted to clarify the importance of theater on my work as an architect. Uh, it is not a book about theater architecture, it's about the experience of architecture. I believe that architecture is beyond just form giving. I don't think the purpose of architects is to make things. I think the purpose of architecture is to create experiences for the public. So I began life as in, in professionally as a scene designer in my own mind. I thought that that would be a wonderful future. The reason being, in the 50s, architecture had been come close to something that was formulaic. There was no study or interest in the past in architecture. It was only contemporary stuff was possible. And the, uh, the, the forms that were made and the systems that were chosen, purified by the modernists, were from my point of view a formula and boring. I wanted architecture to be richer than it was, and I found that richness in theater design because the theater is unashamed of the past. The theater is a great continuity that uses the past in language and certainly in the visual representation on stage. And one of the great talents was Joe Melziner, who was a designer for all of the Rodgers and Hammerstein productions, Tennessee Williams, and it was an amazing moment in time. And, and the most important person was Joe. And I got to work for him. It, it was amazing to me. And even more amazing, he was put together with Eero Saarinen to design at Lincoln Center, the Beaumont Theater. And I was just a kid who could translate between the two. They did not understand each other's uh, professional language. And I was, in essence, the translator, which was a very heady position for someone so young. And in the process, I discovered I want to be an architect. What Eero was doing was so extraordinary. He believed that architecture was problem solving and it existed in a world of ideas. That was far more interesting than anything that was happening then in New York theater. New and old coexist side by side. Each of us is new every day. We got up this morning and it's new opportunity, but we drag along with us all of the experience that we've had that makes us who we are. And so new and old are an intrinsic part of the human condition. And I think it's important to consider that as a part of architecture. And we have therefore done restoration. And I'm particularly pleased to see contrasted Radio City with the Harvey Theater. They are both restorations, both transformations, uh, but back to the original in the case of Radio City and forward into the layering that uh, the Harvey Theater represents. You can read in that room all the layers of activity that have taken place there. I think that's a valuable idea about new and old. It was designed by Hertz and Talent, really New York's finest theater architect, and an extraordinary building which had been allowed to decay through disuse. Uh, we restored the facade itself, and the top 17 feet were put back in place, and that's very much in every way we could what Hertz and Talent had in mind originally, a very colorful terracotta facade. And then the public space of the academy really became the front steps. People just naturally spilled out and used the steps as a part of the public space, particularly in summer months. So it, it was necessary to have a canopy. There never was a canopy for some strange reason. It uses glass actually as a structural element. The glass itself is part of the structure. It's not just laid in a metal frame. And that permits the thing to be open and to be reflective and completely transparent. It's marvelous because as you walk up to the building, you can't help but look up as you climb the stairs and you see the full facade. The contrast between the restoration and the original 1906 building and 
this contemporary statement, which I claim is an ode to Harvey Lichtenstein, I claim it's in honor of him for his contemporary ideas, those two things coming together are, I suspect, a, as good an example of what I think architecture is about. Our project in Jackson, Mississippi, where the lead judge was uh, William Barber, he was concerned that people often come to the building in a state of fear, and therefore it shouldn't be a fortress, it should be welcoming. How do you make a building for public use that's responsive to them, that's responsive to those who've come there, and allows them to think about and to participate in the process of uh, interpreting the law. It was a wonderful challenge to find a way to make a welcoming place. The courtrooms themselves are interesting. They're not theaters. There's no performance in that sense going on there. But the work in the theater was a great help to me because if you see better, you hear better. So many architects take seriously the idea of a courthouse is to establish the authority of the law, and their buildings all seem to have paws on them. They all seem to be strong, authoritative gestures. That isn't the point at all. The point is that something about the larger community and the responsiveness of the building and the rooms to the public and the sense that you can easily find your way around. The people are invisible from the plaza because the lobby's down a half level, or one level. Eero did that because he was trying to connect the lobby between the two levels of the plaza and the garage entrance. He believed the car was, you know, the future and the parking garage. This was a new way to come to the theater. By doing that, however, you never see the theater active because the people are all down below out of sight. We're being given credit for the fact that when you come to the plaza now, when the, the theater is lit at night, it's really gorgeous, it's wonderful glow. You see that and you see the lobby. You don't see the people. But at night now, that thing joined with the lobby makes the whole place look active and it's really wonderful. The future is going to continue to have and wrestle with this discussion of the traditions that we represent, because we're human beings, that being a human being is a long tradition, and the future activities. They're both important, and this, the struggle it takes to accommodate both, I think, will continue. So I think one has to keep a balance. Of course there has to be a future. Of course we're changing, and of course we're different, but we're still human beings.